So a little true and false quiz. Let's see uh, how well you you might know baptism, right? So true or false? The plunge into water of baptism symbolizes a person's burial into Christ's death. Take a second. True or false? The answer is true. So when we get, go into the water of baptism, we die. We are said to die with Christ. Likewise, at a Catholic funeral, we are said to rise with Christ. We kind of switch the language because by taking on Christ, we are now open to eternal life. All right. Next question. Baptism can and should be done more than once, especially in the case of lapsed Catholics who later return to the church. True or false? The answer is false. Baptism is one of the sacraments that is only received once. So we believe that the sacraments, especially baptism, leave an indelible mark on our soul that cannot be washed away. So even if someone is baptized and later on leaves or joins a different church, they will forever have the mark of baptism on there. It cannot be taken away. So it is only ever celebrated once. It's also saying that sacrament of baptism is efficacious. It worked the first time, to, uh, so it does not be, need to be done again and again. Baptism brings God's love into being. True or false? The answer is false. So it doesn't. So God's love is is always there. It doesn't create God's love for us, but rather now we put on Christ. Baptism removes the stain of original sin and all the sins a person has committed. The answer is true or false? True. So this is why in the ancient times of the church, many people would wait till the, the end of their lives to be baptized. And that was because it would remit all sins someone had committed. Uh, but then with the Sacrament of Reconciliation, we saw, no, let's be baptized as soon as possible so that way we can enjoy the graces of God. Uh, and so it removes that original state of original sin, which we'll talk about, and any sins a person has committed up until that point. Since baptism is part of the new covenant made by Jesus, there are no Old Testament prefigurations of baptism. It's only in the New Testament. True or false? False. As we're going to see, baptism is prefigured in the Old Testament and very much has its roots from the Hebrew Scriptures, as does really all the sacraments in many ways. The person being baptized, if he or she is beyond the age of reason, which a lot of times we put around the age of seven when people know the difference between right and wrong, must demonstrate a mature faith. False. Well, we have children being baptized, and even before the age of reason, but even beyond, if adults are baptized, baptism isn't a claim that we have everything figured out. Baptism isn't saying, I know and understand everything God and the church teaches. Rather, it's the starting point. It's, it's the gateway sacrament for that reason. It is the beginning part of our journey. And so we don't need to demonstrate that we have a mature faith in order to be baptized. In an emergency, anyone with the right intention can baptize another uh, can baptize another person. Hmm. True or false? The answer is true. So all of us, by virtue of our Christian baptism, can baptize. Now we're going to see that the ordinary person that does it is a priest or a deacon. But we too can baptize, especially in extreme situations. When we think of nurses in hospitals who a baby is born prematurely and may not have long to live, not enough time for priests to get there, and may baptize, and as long as they follow or come to, come to see as the form and matter of baptism, it's valid. Now, it doesn't mean you go behind your friend at a water fountain and go, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, that, it's not, <laughs> that's not how this works. And ultimately, in extreme, extreme situations, the church does teach, you know, say there's two people left on earth, and you're in the, uh, you know, and, and one of them's an atheist, and you want to be baptized as a Catholic, that they can baptize you as long as they do it with the intention of the church and that you desire it. Again, that's extreme, extreme, extreme situation, not the norm. But any baptized person, of course, can, can baptize. We also might understand what we call the baptism by blood or baptism of desire. So someone who wanted to be baptized but gave their life for the faith before their baptism is said to be baptized, receive the baptism by blood. And someone who wanted to be baptized uh, but right beforehand uh, passed away or died in some way, we might call that a baptism of desire. So they still wanted it. And so really their desire to be in a relationship with God was already there apart from uh, from the sacramental ritual. 
Lastly, there is no possibility of salvation for unbaptized persons, true or false. Oh, hidden by my screen, let me put it away. It is false. So the church, especially in the Second Vatican Council, taught that the Holy Spirit cannot be controlled by the church. The Holy Spirit moves in who it will. And so the possibility for salvation is only up to God. Only God saves. Only God determines who is in ultimate union with God in heaven and who is not. And so while baptism is certainly the surest way to enter into relationship with God and to seek salvation, ultimately God decides who is in union with him in heaven. So some fun facts. So let's talk about what the sacraments of initiation are first in general. So the sacrament, sacraments of initiation are baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. Uh, of these, baptism is what we call the foundational sacrament. It's the first or gateway sacrament. You cannot receive any other of the Catholic sacraments without first being baptized. But the virtue of that, once you've been baptized, you have the right to receive the other Catholic sacraments. And so the purpose of these sacraments bring us into God's people, right? bring us as part of the community, the church. That's why we're called the initiation. They forgive us for our sins and they help us to live that relationship with God. So Dr. Scott Hahn has a great example. He compares baptism to our birth. So we are conceived before birth. But birth really allows us to enter into the world and live in it in a more uh, tangible way. Uh, as opposed to before we're kind of dependent uh, on our mother. In a similar way, before baptism, we're born, we exist, but baptism allows us to live in a relationship with God in a more tangible way, in a more real way, uh, in, where we are no longer kind of bound to the effects of original sin, or bound to original sin, if you will. So where are some of the roots uh, of baptism? Well, if we look for all the way back to Genesis, we see this idea of water and the spirit, which are going to be two reoccurring themes. So in the very, very beginning of, of creation, we see this tohu wabohu, this, uh, this voidless wasteland. And you should see in the first Genesis account of creation, these waters turning over and turning over, and the spirit of God over the waters, churning the waters, and out of the Spirit of God, and out of this proclaiming the Word of God, creation of curse. So we see from these waters and the Spirit's idea of new life, which is going to be a huge theme in baptism. We then turn to the story of Noah and the flood. It's the idea of, of God purging the world of sin through this flood. So water, in Genesis, seen as a creating force, water in the flood, seen as a destructive force destroying evil. And we're going to see that in baptism as the waters of baptism cleanse us of sin, just like the floods cleanse the world of sin. And likewise, no one in the same way are saved by the ark on the water. So the ark is oftentimes an image for the church who administers baptism. And they kind of come out on the other side of the flood to a world free of sin. We kind of come out of the waters of baptism free of sin. We also turn to Exodus, the crossing of the Red Sea, for example. So we have this very clear image of, of baptism in this, in this before the Hebrews were enslaved to the Egyptians in sin. And then God frees them. The Egyptians chased them. And so on one side of the Red Sea is a slavery, it is, their, it is their old way of life. And so they pass through these waters, again, were moved by this strong wind, the same wind. It's from the beginning of Genesis, the spirit, an image for the spirit. And they proceed through the waters and they come out on the other side. The waters destroy the Pharaoh's armies. And we see on the other side now, they're not slaves anymore. They're free from their captives. And so it's a very clear image for baptism, before the waters of baptisms were captives to the slavery of sin, we pass through the waters of baptism and we come out on the other side free from original sin. So we then turn to the New Testament. We see the first instance really is John the Baptist, oftentimes attributed to be Jesus' cousin, uh, the son of Mary's cousin, Elizabeth. And so baptism was already a Jewish ritual. It wasn't a sacrament for, for the Jews, but simply a ritual that signified if someone did it, they took the plunge, what baptism literally means, <coughs> excuse me, it was a sign of turning away from sin and wanting to renew their relationship with God, a sign of purification. 
And so Jesus is baptized, not because he has sin, but because he wants to show that he is one of us. And that it really becomes the beginning part of his ministry here on earth. After that, he goes out into the desert for 40 days to, um, to prepare for his ministry before calling the apostles. So it really starts the beginning of his ministry. And so for us, it begins the, the beginning of our ministry. Baptism also reveals to us who we are. Bapti at Jesus' baptism, there was a dove, again, the Spirit. In all these images, the Spirit of God is there. The Spirit under the sign of a dove is there. And the Father's voice, the sign of the Trinity here in this image. The Father's voice proclaimed, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so baptism is also going to show us who we are. We are children of God. So just like at Jesus' baptism, it reveals who Jesus' identity was. And our baptism reveals who, what our identity is. Baptism then became transformed. Jesus took this ritual of purification in Jewish, in Jewish uh, society and transformed it into an efficacious sign, making it the command by which or through which disciples would be made. So at the end of Matthew's Gospel, before the Ascension, he proclaims, Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in a way, how do we know the Trinity? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Because Jesus in Scripture says as much. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But also because, why do we baptize? Because Jesus commanded us to. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So that's why we baptize in the way that we do. Well, after Jesus' uh, baptism, after he instituted baptism really as a sacrament, the baptism kind of developed in the early church, uh, over a process. So remember that Christianity, for the first 300 years or so, was illegal. It was outlawed. It was uh, we could be in prison and forced not killed for being a Christian. So the majority of people were not Christians, and not every last person could just waltz in. Uh, out of a fear or, or Christians fear that they were just going to turn them in. So there was kind of this process to really prepare this person and vouch that one, they knew what they were getting into, but two, they, they weren't just trying to get into oust Christians, that they actually were genuine. And so this process came to be known as the catechumenate. It had four main stages. You had the pre-catechumenate, which was an initial contact. They heard the gospel from someone, a Christian. They heard it, they received it, and they kind of were being felt out. Usually, you know, are you being genuine? Do you really want to be a Christian? Or are you just trying to infiltrate, you know, the church to get us arrested? You then had the catechumenate, and this would have been a period of about two to three years, where the person who was sponsoring them would really be their teacher and catechist, and they'd learn everything they could about the faith. They would go to the, the now to the uh, church liturgy, but would leave after the liturgy of the word. Then there would be an intensified period right before they were accepted into the church. It's usually during Lent. And there'd be several scrutinies where they would look at their lives and say, where can I improve? What do I need to die to or leave behind to be a Christian? Uh, and this would then prepare them for when they'd be received in the church, which would be during the Easter vigil, which has traditionally been the, the liturgy where new individuals are brought into the church. And there they would receive baptism, be confirmed, and receive their first Eucharist. And after doing that, they would enter a period of what's called mystagogy. It's Greek for mysteries, which is really now kind of what we see the honeymoon phase uh, in a relationship with God. Where now they're enjoying being part of the church, enjoying this newness of the faith, and really start growing and learning, you know, where do I want to fit into the church? How do I want to serve? This really grew. Uh, these stages were really set by the 4th or 5th century, we know, in the church. Uh, and now they really make up what we call the RCIA, or the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. So RCIA is actually the norm for initiation into church, not what we might seem as faith formation or religious set or CCD. That's actually not the norm. The norm is actually adult baptism and uh, this Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults, which follows still these four processes. Now it only takes about a year, this initial contact, and then the catechumenate process where they learn about the faith, and then mystago uh, sorry, then enlightenment during Lent and mystagogia following the period after the Easter Vigil, where they're still baptized, confirmed, and received their Eucharist at the Easter Vigil. Likewise, individuals who might have been baptized but never got First Communion were confirmed, or were baptized for the First Eucharist but never confirmed, can receive the rest of their sacraments through this process at the Easter at the Easter Vigil. Uh, and the interesting thing is we're going to see in baptism too that oftentimes we think of a sponsor as, or as a godparent as you know a family friend who 
we want to give that title to. It's actually not the case at all. If you notice from the early church, the sponsor was the one who vouched for you to the rest of the community and say, hey, this, this person's chill. They're, they're actually you know, wanting to be a part of our community. So your sponsor is really meant to be there for you and they need to be living the faith already because they're supposed to be vouching for you and supporting you in the faith. So keep that in mind going forward if you're seeking baptism, confirmation. That when you choose a sponsor, it really should be someone who can vouch for you, that can encourage you and help you grow in the faith and be your catechist, quite frankly. The other form is faith formation or religious education, CC, regardless of what you call it. This really came out of the development because, well, after Christianity became legalized, well, now there's no more fear and the vast majority of adults were already baptized. And so what did they want? They wanted their children baptized as well. That's not to say that infants weren't baptized beforehand. We see even in Acts, Peter baptizing an entire household and family, including children. So infants and children could be baptized. It just wasn't the norm because, quite frankly, Christianity was still persecuted religion. But now, once it's no longer that, we see families and children being being baptized. Well, now, how do you do the RCIA process, the catechumenate, when you're baptized as a child, usually when it comes before? You can't do that with, with someone right after birth. So what happens was, was it kind of became inverted. The uh, catechumenate process was placed after baptism, and the sacraments initiation were separated. Rather than receiving them all at once, they're separated out into three different sacraments, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. And then after different developments, confirmation was kind of put at the end piece of it to confirm that they have gone through this process. Usually baptism would confirm the catechumenate process, but since it already occurred, confirmation served as that confirmation of that baptism. And we'll talk about that once we get into confirmation and how the apostles went and confirmed baptisms of different Christians that happened without them baptizing them. But because of this, some dioceses have moved the Eucharist to after confirmation, since confirmation usually occurred right after baptism. The difficulty with this is we start to see this process of faith formation and religious education, CCD, as kind of a school process, an education process, and confirmation as a graduation. Again, we'll talk about this more when we get to confirmation, but I encourage you not to look at it so. See it rather as the original catechumenate process that it was called to be, a process of falling in love with God, a process of falling in love with the church, of developing a relationship with Christ and the church community. And so for those of, you, of us who were baptized as kids, it was a great gift that our parents gave to us to be baptized as our children. So that way from the very beginning, we could already be in God's grace and could already be involved in this part of the church and receive the graces. Who wouldn't want to give these graces to their children? By the way, because remember, God is who gives the graces. We do not earn them. So why not give it to even the least of these, these children? But now we now kind of have to take the ownership of our baptism. We kind of have to own the sacrament that we were given and learn, well, what does it mean? What is this relationship with God? How can I fall in love with God? That's a very different approach than just, you know, I got to go to Sunday school. Or I got to learn about church teaching. First, fall in love with God. Fall in love with a relationship with who God is just like those who had to risk their life for entering the church in the catechumenate. So baptism as a celebration. Remember, sacraments have four, four uh, categories or um, uh, characteristics, if you will, excuse me, characteristics. Memorial, so what we recall, we saw last module. Celebration, that it's a ritual, we'll see this module. And communion and transformation, we'll see next module. So the rite of baptism mainly has four main parts. The reception of the candidate, the one to be baptized, the liturgy of the word, the celebration of baptism, and a concluding rite. Oftentimes you'll see the ritual for children. Remember, that's not the norm. It's an adapted version for children. Uh, so sometimes baptism can be celebrated outside of Mass. Sometimes a lot of churches do it after Mass. And so that will be its own little liturgy that will follow these four steps. Sometimes baptism will be done during Mass. Actually, my son uh, was baptized during Mass, and I've included some images for your viewing pleasure uh, to give a first-hand glimpse of what a baptism looked like during Mass. So what that would happen in that case was you would follow the 
the setup or the framework of the mass as is, and these parts would just be introduced through it. So like the reception of the candidate would be at the beginning of mass, the liturgy of the word would be the normal liturgy of the word in, in mass, the celebration of baptism would occur after the homily, and uh, the concluding rite could either be done after the celebration of baptism or at the end of mass, depending on, on the priest as well. For adult baptism that is usually done during Easter vigil, this kind of ritual is, is simply limited to the celebration of baptism in the concluding rite. Um, because the Easter vigil is not only a mass, but its own ornate liturgy, uh, usually baptism confirmation occur one right after the other. Uh, and so some of these pieces are just used whatever's the regular pieces in, in the Easter vigil. So there are adaptations with it, but I go with the norm because this is probably what we'll end up seeing uh, for baptism one day. Okay. So we'll start with deception of the candidate. There's a video showing a baptism. I didn't film my son's baptism. I apologize. Uh, so it, this can serve as an explanation to that video. So really the family, you'll see in the, in the picture in the upper left, uh, my wife holding my son and, and Father Karens, who was the priest who baptized my son. Uh, the priest or the minister, because a deacon can also baptize, which we'll see, uh, welcomes the family. And really they're going to ask the, the family the parents, what do you desire of the church? So really, it's the parents asking for baptism. The church is not forcing it, but really, it's the family asking the church, can you please offer baptism to our child? We see the sponsors. So we see the bottom picture myself in blue. I was very pensive. Don't worry, I was enjoying every minute of it. My wife with my son and our uh, two good friends, uh, uh, Lauren and Josh, who are our son's godparents. To be a godparent or a sponsor, at least one is needed for baptism. They need to be fully initiated into the church, so they themselves have to have received baptism, Eucharist, and confirmation. And they should be practicing their faith. And we kind of talked about a little bit last module that sponsors vouched for the individuals entering the church. And so it's kind of hard to do that when you yourself are not really practicing the faith. It's not meaning that we're perfect. It doesn't mean that we have everything figured out, but that we're making an effort to, to live our relationship with God because then it's going to be their responsibility along with parents to help this person grow in the faith. Uh, and really the parents are the first church. We call it domestic church. So in many ways, the role of really bringing someone up in the faith and teaching them isn't the churches, it's parents and families. And so that says a lot about where we first learn the faith is at home and from role models. And maybe that's not the case for some of us, but then who can we turn to? Who, what role models can we have that can be our examples for teaching us our faith? When the uh, child or the candidate is received, the sign of the cross is traced on their forehead. It's a sign of the Trinity, a sign of our face. And it's basically to say that we claim them for Christ. You will belong now to Jesus Christ. Uh, and then the parents and godparents also sign the forehead of the candidate or child. After the reception of the candidate, we move into the liturgy of the word. Uh, so in a normal mass, this would just be the normal liturgy of the word. Uh, but if not, there's some kind of scripture reading, and it usually is a scripture reading that recalls something from last module in terms of what we recall in baptism, perhaps knowing the flood, the crossing of the Red Sea, Jesus' baptism, etc. We have prayers of the faithful or intercessions where we pray for the candidate, their parents, godparents, sponsor, as they're about to enter into this church community and uh, community of faith as children of God, that they may be strengthened in doing so. Uh, and we also ask the prayers of our family members in heaven. This is done very beautifully, usually at the Easter vigil. We usually always in any baptism, there's prayers asked of the saints, our family members in heaven. So just like we ask everyone in the church community to pray for uh, the new, those who are about to be baptized, we also ask our family members in heaven to pray for the uh, for this individual who's going about to be called to be a saint. For you know, usually we'll go, you know, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us. Joseph, Saint Joseph, pray for us. Saint Therese of Lisieux, pray for us. And so we'll do this repetition. We're asking our family members in heaven to pray for us. There is a prayer of exorcism. Now, let me be clear. This is not the church saying that the 
child or candidate is possessed all right this is not hollywood there's no crucifixes with pea soup and if you don't know what i'm talking about with pea soup go look up the movie the exorcism all right it's not that yes the church still teaches exorcisms and and the ability to be possessed but this is not the case this is we are not saying the candidate or the child are possessed in any way rather it's simply a prayer to rid uh, any of the individual of any evil that that it might be there remember we're getting rid of evil and sin and original sin through baptism so this prayer serves that purpose we then have the anointing with the oil of the catechumens so there's three oils in the church usually if you walk into a catholic church they'll be out in what we call an ambry a by baptismal baptismal font hopefully uh and the first uh oil is the oil of catechumens which is uh oil that is blessed or anointed on those about to be baptized remember the catechumens from the catechumenate process and so a candidate at this point or baby at this point is now a catechumen so they're anointed with the oil of catechumens uh there's sacred chrism which they will receive later on in baptism it is also given at uh confirmation in holy orders and the oil of the sick used to anoint those who are ill in the sacrament of anointing of the sick so what comes down to the nuts and bolts of baptism so in every sacrament there's what's called the form and matter and i believe all these are listed in a chart on page 42 in your textbook meeting jesus in the sacraments essentially apart from all the ritual there are certain things that need to be said and certain things that need to be done by a certain individual for the sacrament to be efficacious for it to be effective so the form is what needs to be said in baptism what needs to be said is what we call the trinitarian formula i baptize you in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit the trinity and these are the words that jesus commanded in matthew's gospel the matter what's the matter uh -huh. the matter refers to what we call the elements in the gesture so the thing we have to use and what we have to do with that thing element the thing we have to use gesture what we have to do with that thing so the element is water water that's been blessed preferably holy water uh, and immersion or that water being poured over the head three times while the form is being said so that is at the very basic what is needed for a, va a valid baptism the ordinary minister is a priest or deacon knowing that a bishop is a priest so think of it like you know whatever that level can do a deacon any level above it can do what that level can and more so a bishop is a priest as well and of course we talked about beginning of last module any baptized christian in case of emergency so we get to the actual celebration of baptism you see my son's baptism here uh, on your left uh, first the water is usually blessed and prayers are prayed over the water by the priest or deacon and it calls to mind jesus paschal mystery and that he died for us and that baptism is going to save us water in turn is a sign of cleansing and new life so the outward sign water washes us inward sign cleanses us of original sin and gives us new life then for an infant baptism the adult uh the infant baptism the parents and godparents proclaim the baptismal promises in an adult baptism the adult candidate says it on their own these are promises that basically declare our faith as a community and really they're statements that summarize the creed do you believe in god the father almighty creator of heaven and earth i do do you believe in jesus christ his only son our lord i do uh do you believe in, in the holy spirit the lord the giver of life i do do you reject satan and all his empty is his uh empty promises and all his works i do so essentially through these declarations we're making vows just like at marriage you make vows to your spouse of of what you promise in that relationship here we're entering a more formal relationship with god so we make vows of our promises to god that we will reject sin and satan and we will believe in god and trust in god and choose god after the form matter after water is poured over the head three times while the form is being said the candidate is now anointed with sacred chrism sacred chrism is unique it's it's olive oil mixed with perfume and at the chrism mass usually during holy week where these oils are made the bishop will literally breathe into the jar of oil breathing the holy spirit onto the onto the oil when we get this from john's gospel where jesus breathed the holy spirit on the apostles and so the successors of the apostles breathed the spirit onto the sacred chrism so it's really a sign of being chosen and now you've been baptized you're now being sealed on your forehead with a mark just like you seal an envelope before it can go out now you're sealed 
as a child of God. And it's reminiscent of the kings in the Old Testament. That when, for example, Solomon went to anoint Saul as the first king of Israel, he poured oil on his head. And really, if you think about it, if you're walking around with oil on your head, you know, people are going to notice you're different. So it's kind of a sign that you've been set apart. You're now different. Lastly, now, the, the church gives the individual or their parents several signs uh, to signify what baptism does to them. So you usually receive a lit candle because now sin has been taken away from you, the stain of original sin, and now the light of Christ dwells in you. So I don't know, if, ask your parents, maybe they've kept these things. Ask them about what happened at your baptism if it was similar. Uh, we still have our son's uh, candle that I was holding in that picture, I'm very amused. Uh, and then now it signifies this is the light of Christ. And this light from this candle is taken from the Paschal candle, which is lit every year at the Easter vigil. So the Paschal candle is a sign of Jesus' resurrection, and it's lit twice for every Catholic, once at your baptism and once at your funeral. So that way it signifies that what the light of Christ that we have received, where we have died with Christ in baptism, we receive again at, at our death, where we rise again with him if we have lived according to his ways. And then the white garment. So we put on Christ, the sign of purity. Now we've been washed of the stain of original sin, so now we're clean. So now we put on a white garment to show we are clean, we are pure. Lastly, it ends with what's called the Ephetata prayer. So this comes from scripture where Jesus uh, prayed over the um, and touched the blind man's eyes and the mute man's mouth and the lame uh, or or person's legs who couldn't walk and so it's a prayer over the candidate or infant's ears and mouth not saying that they're deaf or mute but rather to pray that they might be able to proclaim the gospel message so for adults it happens before the baptismal promises so that they may have the grace to genuinely proclaim the baptismal promises that they're uh, for their baptism for infants it happens after receiving the candle as a prayer that they might come to proclaim the faith that they just were baptized in lastly the concluding rites. so there's usually a prayer of blessing that is said over the family and usually it's prayed for the newly baptized candidate the mother after especially for an infant having given birth uh, or just simply giving life to this to the candidate and for the sponsoring godparents and supporting this candidate in the journey that they might help them in living a good faith so you see throughout the ritual there's a lot of different use of sign and symbols to focus on the fact of how baptism helps us be a new creation that it helps us die to sin die to an old way of life and take on a new life in christ be made pure and be ready and given everything that we need to live our relationship with Jesus Christ. So when we talk about the effects of baptism, we refer to baptism as communion, in that when baptism affects us, it draws us together as a church. So every sacrament you're gonna see this gives what we call sanctifying grace. So there's actual grace, so God's help in a certain moment, and sanctifying grace, God's life-sustaining help that helps us to get to heaven, quite frankly. Uh, so there's two main effects in baptism. The first is that the baptized person becomes dead to sin. So what this basically tr is translated as is all our sin, especially original sin, uh, is washed away. So original sin oftentimes is thought of as the first sin made by Adam and Eve. Original sin, I mean, while this is the image for it, Original sin is actually the fallen state of humanity. So the reality of whether, regardless of whether or not we're religious, we, we realize that humans make mistakes, that we have this tendency to hurt others. We might have this tendency not to love or to fall. This state of being fallen, we refer to as original sin. It's attributed to that first choice, that first choice not to love God. Um, but because of that, we have these after effects where now all of humanity, we have this kind of this state of where we can fall into sin. So it takes away the stain of that. We might still have the inclination to sin, but now we're strengthened against that inclination to actually focus more towards God. So before baptism, we might have been geared or oriented away from God. After baptism, we're oriented toward God. And now what we do in our lives afterwards, we can reorient it away from God. Uh, you know, someone may ask, you know, just because I was baptized doesn't keep someone from not choosing to love God and to reject God in their life. And 
quite frankly, we might know of a lot of individuals who were baptized and then never believed in God again, as unfortunate as it was. And usually there's a lot of the circumstances for that, but at the very least, it comes from, did we recognize that this is an opportunity to enter into a relationship with God? Or if we, if we did not know at that moment we were too young, we, that we know now and own that. So part of it is even though we're baptized and forgiven of sin, we can still screw up afterwards. And that's where the sacrament of reconciliation comes in, because, you know, I might you know, hurt you and go to you and say, I'm sorry, and then you forgive me. But then what happens afterwards, if I, you know, mess up again, I usually go back and say, I'm sorry. So we have this constant opportunity to ask for forgiveness, and that God gives us ready opportunities for forgiveness, uh, shows a lot about God's mercy and that God wants us to be in union with him. But the first fact is that it's going to help us take away the stain of original sin. Part of this is we're called to be like Jesus and Mary. So we have Adam and Eve, in the garden, the image from from the second creation account, where uh, Adam and Eve are given everything by God and yet are tempted and choose to disobey God. And it's really, look at our own lives. We do the same thing. God is, may, have, may give us everything, life, grace, strength, his son on the cross, and yet we might still turn away from God. Uh, and so we might still choose to reject God and make ourselves God, which is a really big temptation. And a lot of times people say, you know, I'm not religious. We're all religious in some regard. It's a matter of just of what do you worship or who do you worship uh, and that we're called through baptism to worship God alone rather than something or ourselves. And so while Adam and Eve failed by disobeying God, Jesus obeyed God. Jesus obeyed God the Father, I should say. Uh, and where he was tempted, he didn't fall through. And so we call him the new Adam. Likewise, where Eve failed, Mary showed faith in God and said yes to be the mother of God. So we call it the new Eve. So we're called to be configured to Jesus and Mary, the new Adam and the new Eve, to ourselves be new Adams and new Eves through our baptism. The other main grace of baptism is that it re we receive new life in the Holy Spirit. What that basically means is we belong to Christ now. We're, our our state of virgin sin is taken away. We're ch called children of God. We receive divine adoption. We're given the seal on our souls, the sacramental character, we receive the grace of justification that St. Paul talks about in Romans, the grace of God that saves us, and that we are called to continue to live in that grace, to choose to live in that grace, that while God will always seek to be a part of us, that through our choices and the way we live our life, that we choose to love God in return. God does not force us to love him, and so by our lives, we can choose to turn away from him. But in baptism, we're given this grace of the Holy Spirit, these gifts of the Holy Spirit to help us to live a new life. And this is great, a great sign of this is in the adult baptism of RCIA at the Easter Vigil, you'll see in the bottom left corner, the candidate usually wears a dark robe or a brown robe. And then after their baptism, they put on a white robe, signifying that more clearly that purity. Um, in addition to this, we're now considered members of the church, not yet fully initiated unless we, until we receive the other sacraments of initiation. Uh, and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We're now temples of the Holy Spirit. So God's own life force is now in us. How crazy is that? God's own life force is in us. But like with anything, we have to act upon these graces in order to be able to experience their fruits. So you might recall that from the second module, we talked about how Jesus was priest, prophet, and king, and that's really summarized his mission, that he was going to sacrifice his life for us as priest, proclaim the good news of the kingdom as prophet, and that by doing so, he is the king of kings. Uh, so in a similar way, at baptism, we're actually given something to do. It's not a matter of just being baptized, and now we can just sit back. We actually have work to do. Uh, and so part of our mission is to be like Christ, priest, prophet, and king. That Now we have to help individuals realize God's intentions for them, build the kingdom of God, to follow the two greatest commandments, to love God above all else, and to love our neighbor as ourself. And we can do that in three ways, as priest, prophet, and king. As priest, how can we sacrifice our lives for God? How can we sacrifice our time, our efforts for those around us, especially those in need? How can we give our lives to God and say, God, this is my life, I give it to you? How can we, as prophets, proclaim the good news? There's a lot of messages, a lot of agendas, a lot of divisive messages that are proclaimed in the world today. We believe that the gospel is good news and that it offers hope, 
salvation, forgiveness for everyone. How can we proclaim that each day, both in our words, to not be afraid to share our faith, but also at the same time in our actions to live and practice what we preach? Lastly, we are kings. Do we believe that we are children of God? And because that we're heirs to the inheritance of eternal life, do we live like we're heirs to the inheritance of eternal life? Or do we try to turn away from the gift of eternal life? So we are called to be priests, prophets, and kings, but it's up to us whether or not we accept this mission each day and live intentionally. So how does baptism transform us? Well, it's going to help us to live out this mission by giving us three virtues, what we call good habits or dispositions. It's going to gift us with the gift of faith, the gift of hope, and the gift of love. So by using these three dispositions or virtues, hopefully we can grow stronger in relationship with God. And look at the picture on the left on the screen. It's a very old and famous image of Jesus knocking on a door, but notice there's no door handle on the outside. And so it's a metaphor for our lives, for our hearts, that we can only let Jesus in. Jesus does not force himself in. So first virtue we have is a faith. Faith is ultimately the disposition to believe and be committed to God. A lot of people think, well, I, I can't have faith. I, I'm t I need reason. I need to see. I need, I need rationality. I have too much of a rational mind to believe. The problem is faith and reason don't, don't contradict one another. A lot of times people pit them together, but they really don't. Rather, reason helps us to come to know what faith declares. And so by trusting in God, we can come to see and realize what our reason shows. It also recognizes that ultimately God is beyond all knowing. God is beyond all reasoning. And so by having faith and trust in God and what he has done for us, we can come to know. We can come to understand. Faith in God, though, has to be lived. It can't be hidden or just spoken. I can't say, yeah, I'm a Catholic or, yeah, I'm a Christian. But well, how do you live your life? Christians are meant to stand out, not stand in. Could someone tell that you are a Christian just by watching you for a day, by the way you live your life? Or could they not? Christ, in order to live out our faith, has called us through different things. And in the Gospels of in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters five to seven, he goes through about three chapters outlining his expectations for his followers and what he expects them to do and avoid. He calls us essentially to right action in relationships, aka to have relationships with God and with others that are sacrificial, loving, that are giving, that are other centered. And that seeks us to make choices and actions that honor God. To carry our cross daily. Sometimes it's hard to live out our faith, but to not give up, to not try to want to cut down our cross, but to actually want to actually live our faith every single day in prayer, in action, the way we talk with others, to not be ashamed to say, yeah, you know, I'm a Catholic or I'm a Christian or I believe in Christ or, or yes, I go to church or yes, I pray, to not be ashamed of that, to be servant leaders. To lead is actually to serve. Those who just seek after their own benefit really don't get too many followers to stay with, it, with them for too long. But we lead by example, and that's what Jesus did. So how can we in our own lives, in our families, at school, uh, in the world, lead by example to live out God's will for us? Next virtue or disposition is hope. Uh, so hope is going to be similar to faith in that there's trusting involved in both, right? In faith, we may say we might trust in God. Uh, hope is trusting, but trusting what is yet to come. So what has a, is in the future. So I might trust uh, what God will do in my life. I might trust in God's promise for eternal life. I might trust that God might give me the strength uh, to live my faith. Really what hope is going to do is it's going to reflect what we desire. So sometimes we have to look at, well, what am I hoping for and what am I, do I actually want in life? Again, you know, regardless of whether we think we're religious individuals, everyone is religious to a certain degree. There's all things that we worship in some way, shape, or form, certain things that we give attention to and that kind of are the priority of our life. And if you want to know what your ultimate ultimate, ultimately what you worship, what is the ultimate priority of your life that drives all things? Is it God? Or is it something else? Ultimately, the only thing that will fulfill us 
is God. We've been, the desire for God is written on the human heart. God, like the artist of creation that put us into existence, left his mark on us. And so to truly fulfill our desire, especially for what we expect, our hope has to be rooted in God. We also have to help others hope. What the moral theologian Father James Keenan calls to be leaders of hope. Do you go out and all you do, do you build people up or do you tear them down? Do you enable people to be the best version of themselves or do you disable people? Be leaders of hope. We need leaders of hope now more than ever in our world. And so to have that disposition ourselves and to then pass it on to someone else is a way to live out our baptism, especially to pass on the hope in God. Lastly, probably the greatest of these, according to St. Paul, is the virtue of love, also known as charity. Again, love is not simply an emotion. And I can do a lot of things just based on what I feel, but that would probably just make me a flaky person. That's why a lot of times we say, you know, I feel this, or I, I, I want to do what I feel, or whatever I feel is right. I mean, feelings are good, or emotions are good, but they're certainly not a good basis for action. We don't want to be flaky. We don't want to, you know, we know of individuals who might be, uh, you know, snakes or dubs or, or individuals who might say certain things and then don't follow through just because that's how they felt. I mean, we don't really appreciate that in our lives. So real love, real charity comes through not an emotion, but through action. Real love, real charity is an ability. And that's why we usually call acts of service acts of charity because they are actions. So the best way to live at our baptism is how can we will what God wants for others? God, if we trust that Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it to the full, God desires the very best for us. Sometimes that's not what we want. What God wants sometimes is not what we want. Sometimes our desires are selfish. If we're going to be honest here, if we're going to be honest, sometimes we just want to do whatever. But do we try, if we trust in God that God was willing to actually die for us, I don't know about you, but no one else has gone up on a cross and died for me, so I'm going to trust God above anything else. If God knows our plans for our lives, if God knows us better than we know ourselves, then how can we trust God? And if we're going to trust God, then how can we seek after what God wants for us? Now, that's been a hard thing in my own life, but usually whenever I've sought after what God wants, it's been better than whenever I've tried to just do things my own. I just end up putting my foot in my mouth. The virtue of love helps us to not only love God, to desire what God wants for us. And I know there's a trust issue with that because then we think, you know, I'm letting God dictate my life. I want to be in control of my life. I mean, that's fair. God gives us freedom to, to own our lives, to act. But by taking on baptism, we say, God, I trust you. God, I, I, I love you. God, I know you love me. God is not some God in the sky with some magnifying glass trying to burn us down or kill us or make our lives miserable. You know, if they're suffering in the world, it's because we cause it for one another. God is actually the solution. God is love. And so it says, God, I love you enough to trust you enough. Help me in my life. Help me to know what to put first. Help me to know what to do. Help me to love others, especially those who annoy me. You know, God died for the person who cut you off in traffic just as much as you, the person who disagrees with you just as much as you, the person who has way too many groceries in the checkout aisle at the supermarket. He died for them just as much as you. So how can we love the other, even the enemy? It's a hard part of Christianity. A lot of people say all you have to do to be a Christian is love, but do you understand what love is? Love takes sacrifice. Love takes focus. Love takes discipline. Love is dying on the cross. Each day when I look at my wife and my child, I have to lay down my life for them. It's not just about, that doesn't matter even if I don't feel like it. Even if I don't, that day I'm too tired and I don't feel like loving my wife, I don't feel like loving my son. True love, genuine love, the love when we know we're being loved and not used, that love it happens regardless of how we feel. And so we're called to love that same way. That kind of love, yeah, that's Christian love. But that love takes effort. It takes sacrifice. It takes time. And so that's why in baptism we need this disposition given to us by the Holy Spirit. So pray. If you struggle to believe, pray for faith. If you struggle with despair in your own life, pray for hope. If you struggle to love, genuine love, and not use, pray for the gift of love. In those ways, every time when you're, you struggle with doubt, but you say, Lord, I'll believe in you, you're living out your baptism. For every single time that 
you're saying, God, I just want to give up, but I'm going to trust in you. You're living out your baptism. For every time you say, God, I'm angry and I'm hurt, but I'm going to still love. You're living out your baptism. And so in these great ways, don't underestimate faith, hope, and love. Love like Christ did, and you can change the world. Believe in that. You can change the world. Live out your baptism. Accept the authority of your baptism, as one great professor said, and you can change the world.